Well, welcome back to another one of our podcasts. This is me, Hugh Waters, and over there in London City is young Phil Crawley, who's going to be talking to us today about a subject um, that I'm not actually all that strong on, and it's going to be very interesting. Um, it's going to be about well, connectors, display connectors, and how do we get the pictures to the screen? But there's a bit more to it than that, Phil. You're going to give us a little bit of a background to um, some of the interconnectivity that we are familiar with, SDI and uh, and things like that. So, Phil, why don't you just uh, kick off yeah. and I'll interrupt when, when it confuses me. <laughs> well, so, so as, as, as broadcast engineers, obviously, um, you know, the sort of the, the bedrock of our, of our working world is, is, is SDI, the Serial Digital Interface. Um, obviously, starting with REC 601 that's been with us um, for, well, since the early 80s now, uh, uh, but obviously came to prominence with, with in the early 90s with DigiBeta and, and, and all the formats that came after D1, I suppose. Um, and then obviously uh, 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 SDI is an extensible series of standards that, that, that go all the way up to our current sort of, um, you know, new, newest um, uh, cool kid on the block, um, 3G video, um, which allows for uh, three gigabit per second um, over a single coaxial cable, um, uh, high definition, uh, 1080p, um, so 50 progressive frames per second uh, of 422 or, or 25, 24, 23, 976 um, and all the other uh, frame rate variations at um, uh, uh, 444, you know, so RGB. So, so you know, captured yep. in the camera RGB all the way through the post-production process, you know, being able to do amazingly clean keys and, and all those things all the way through to a delivery tape, which might be on... on, on, on um, uh, HD Cam SR, uh, Sony's um, uh, you know format that supports that, um, but but again it's it, it, it's it's the extensible nature of the sort of the family of standards that runs all the way back to the early 80s and 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 what we kind of uh, and how we dealt with all that and the, and the slide I've got up at the moment is is sort of ripped from a little presentation I do about the, about this this whole kind of business and and thinking about 601's sort of early incarnation. Um, four by three was the aspect ratio, so we were all still watching television on 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 square uh, CRTs at that point. Well, I say square, but four by three you, you know, <laughs> CRTs. Well, prob- it's the same aspect ratio as this Skype window that I'm I'm, I'm looking at at the moment. Um, okay. And uh, and and, um, and and so you know in in in. Um, in Europe, in, in PAL, in 65 land, uh, that's a resolution of 720 pixels across the screen to 576 lines of active picture. And, and that gave us enough digital resolution to encompass what we got, you know, the 5.5 megahertz, um, uh, you know, standard definition of video that we were all very comfortable with. And, and you know, to further, uh, uh, you know, just to finish that off really, it was, it was 422, it was the YCBCR um, luminance stroke color difference encoding system. Um, and then, and then, you know, as as the '90s came around, uh, that all kind of moved into 16 by 9. But again, the same resolution. Um, there was a variation of, of of SDI at 360 megabits per second that never really caught on. Thompson supported it a bit, um, w- which had I think 960 pixels across the line, which then obviously gave the same horizontal resolution for a wider screen as 720 pixels across the screen for 4 by 3 did but right. never really caught on. And, and we all got very used to the fact that DigiBeta tapes might be carrying a 4x3 recording or they might be carrying a 16x9 recording. And that, yeah. that gave lots of confusion to tape ops who sort of refer to things like sort of anamorphic recordings, which is, is nonsense because that implies that, um, you know, the pixels of, a, of yeah. an SDR recording were square. And they were never square. Even at 4x3, the pixels aren't square. Um, but, you know, I suppose the confusion there is that a lot of people are used to computer graphics formats. Um, and yeah. they're used to how TIFFs and TARGs and JPEGs and all those kind of things are laid out. But but at this point, back in the early 80s, this is before Photoshop. This is before yes. people yes. had computers that could handle TV resolution type images. So they were different different worlds, really. And, and, and uh, you know, the, the, I suppose a lot of that confusion has gone now because we're all very comfortable with um, computer graphics formats. And in fact, uh, high definition video is by its nature always square pixels, 16 by 9, 1920 by, by, by 1080, or um, 1280 by 720 is square pixels at 16 by 9. So, so kind of, in, in a sense, you know, the later incarnations that have supported HDSDI, so um, Rec 709, they've tended to move towards uh, computer graphics formats rather than away from them. And of course, yeah. coming now with 3G video, which is, you know, can carry RGB data, 444. We're kind of almost entirely back onto the computer graphics bandwagon because computer graphics have always been an RGB system, and 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 why CBCR, why UV, as we often you know, erroneously call it, it has very much been the uh, domain of television. Uh, so I've yeah. just got a slide up now which kind of shows 
the uh, the SMPTE standards and how they progressed through SDI and um, uh, and, and uh, 1.5 gig uh, through uh, dual link HDSDI up to 3G H, uh, HDSDI. The actual um, data structure of these is fairly similar, is it not? Or, or are there big differences? Well, it's it was all well defined from the get go. Um, uh, you know, Rec 601. Um, acknowledges itself as being a substandard of a wider range of, of digital video standards. And so the, the, the raster format, um, so, so you know, how many pixels across, how, how many lines down, um, how color is sampled, you know, co-sighted um, chrominance samples with the luminance samples, 42, 444, all those things uh, are well defined and they all kind of relate to each other. So, so if you looked at uh, the standard for 601 from 82, and you look at the current incarnation of, of SMPTE uh, 424 um, yeah. uh, for 3G video, um, you know, you can see that they've, they've all got exactly the same lineage, uh, you know, and it, it's a testament to, to the people who were devising those standards in the early 80s that they could see that these things wouldn't stop where they left off. You know, it's a bit like TCP IP, I suppose. You know, the people who were yeah. devising TCP IP in the 70s, you know, the fact that they were so far-sighted to see that these standards would have to expand and evolve and, and encompass things that they'd never even thought of, it then yeah. becomes a testament to them that, that, that they, they kind of covered the bases in terms of making these extensible standards. Yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Okay. So I interrupted you just as you were you know, telling us about these um, the comparisons there. Yeah, so I was I was I was then going to barge straight through into 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 three G, which has kind of been with us for sort of five or six years now. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, obviously, HD Cam SR is is the, is Sony's VTR format that supports that. Um, uh, the fifty eight hundred uh, decks will record three G uh, uh, yeah. in their eight hundred eighty megabit mode, and there's there's a plethora of of uh, transport formats that could be carried over 3G. Um, uh, the, the ones that, that we're most familiar with, the, the uh, SMPT 292A and B, are, are the ones that people really have to deal with on a daily basis, and, and, and they relate to, you know, how, is my 3G link carrying the A and the B link of a dual link sig signal, or is my 3G signal just carrying the full range um, single link, but with with all the data packaged up together, as it were. Um, yeah. Uh, in fact, Tektronix have a fantastic um, PDF, which I should have put a link to, but but um, maybe I'll, I'll put a lower third uh, showing where to get that, which shows okay. exactly how the packets format for the different um, variations of the of the the SMPTE 292 spec. I think that would help actually. It, it really, when you're when you're when you're blasting these um, these acronyms around, I always think it helps like mad just to remember what we're really talking about. It is a little railway train of of data, and just, you know. If you, if I find it much more helpful if I can visualise, even if I don't know it in detail, the visualise that you know, what we're doing. So when yes, let, let's get that PDF up. That'd be great. Absolutely, and and, and that's the great thing about podcasts, isn't it? You can you can uh, you can <laughs> pause it, look up the URL that you see on screen, and and, and carry on. So uh, so, but uh, all, all this stuff about HDSDI uh, is is I suppose just background really to to the meat of today, uh, where we're going to talk about um, uh, computer display formats. I suppose you'd call them, yeah. although there's such convergence nowadays. I've just thrown up a um, a screen grab from my trusty Tektronix 8300, um, which is showing um, what a 3G signal looks like, um, uh, you know, from the physical layer measurements. So so there's the mm -hmm. iPad on top uh, left, which. You know, very visually tells you everything you really need to know about the health of your connection between two machines. And of course, it's worth stating that um, uh, you know when when you start out with analog video, the voltage that's being carried on the cable uh, represents something about the picture that you're talking about. You, you know, sort of peak white is 0.7 of a volt, one, one volt if you're thinking about where the sinks are. Uh, you know, and, yep. and 0.3 is black level and all that kind of stuff. But obviously, when you're carrying a digital representation of a television picture over over a coaxial cable. Um, the things that are traveling down that coaxial cable, they don't have a direct bearing on, on, on the picture. It's what they're carrying is the picture, as it were. And so, yes, yes. And so looking at the eye diagram tells you nothing about, about the content of the picture and the audio and all those other things. Um, but it's, it's as important because obviously it shows you the health of the link and, and it means that uh, you, know, you, you can ensure that you never see any green splats on, on that received picture. Um, yeah. and, so, and, so, and so really I suppose just re really for as, as, a, as a little aside I've stuck this up and, and uh, the nice thing about uh, you know decent um, 
physical layer measurement devices like the Tektronix AC300 is that they can they can tell you an awful lot about not only how healthy the picture is or not how healthy the signal is but how far you are away from it falling over and not being very healthy anymore um, so uh, um, this is this is how you want your 3G signal to look literally before it's had any damage done to it by a cable so this is a very short yes. cable and, and in fact so short that the uh, the, the the otdr the, the, the time domain reflectometer within the test set can't measure how long it is so it's it's it's, it's, it's saying it's zero meters long and uh, and you know we've got a, we've got a, an eye diagram that looks very healthy and uh, you know our jitter which is very low for both 100 hertz filtered jitter and 100 kilohertz um, alignment jitter so yep. so that that's that's kind of i suppose just a, a nice little visual thing to have a look at and, and it, so that's a nigh on perfect eye yep yep it don't get any better better than that um and in fact when we do our podcast about uh 3g and and all the considerations of cabling for that i've got some fantastic um slides where an engineer who used to work for me um went through and we took six, six different cable types and um, cut them to varying lengths and, and did all those 3G measurements from zero meters all the way up to hundreds of meters for different kinds of cable, for different kinds of connectors and stuff, and got a real feel for how, how 3G video behaves um, you know, it, over those physical links. And uh, in fact, Bright Broadcast commissioned us to do that, and it was a very interesting thing. And we're about to redo it, because that was about three years ago. We're about to Thank redo you. it with the current crop of... Um, of of manufacturers cables that they claim are good for 3G and you'd be surprised well three years ago we were surprised how much variation there was between different manufacturers and how some of the budget cables behaved as well as the very high end oh, really? cables and how some of the sort of like nearly high end cables you know weren't very good at all so you know 3G it's a, it's it's a it's a big old subject but but we're about to redo all those tests in the next few weeks and and I think that will make a fantastic subject for a podcast. Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, so here we have the. Um, I've got a slide up which sort of shows it. I mean, it's, it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit busy, um, but it shows all the different kind of or typical computer resolutions going back, I suppose, to the early eighties, the same as, as SDI. Yeah. Um, so, uh, and, and and what people used to call them. So CGA, which predated sort of the current VGA, um, or I suppose the last of the analog standards, um, was a three twenty by two hundred re uh, resolution standard. And that runs all the way up through what we sort of traditionally call VGA. But VGA, I suppose, is, is, is a bit of a bit of a catch-all. You know, we, we refer to any kind of analog RGB computer display as a VGA display, um, and up through the different display standards, and right up to the kind of the QSXGA, which is sort of 2K, the, the way cinema people work, and um, uh, um, UXGA, which is uh, kind of um, thin raster HD and, and, and all that. But, but there's, there's kind of a name and an acronym given to each of these um, display standards. But that's probably because, um, you know, there's so many of them and, and they essentially relate to computer displays. And a few of them coincide with what we call television resolutions, but not many. Sorry about that, man delivering furniture. Man delivering right, furniture, fantastic. Yeah. <laughs> mm, mm. <laughs> So, um, yeah, okay. If if we're thinking about computer displays, um, and 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 to, to a facilities engineer, you often have to make computer displays go a long way around a building. It's often the case that people want, you know, the edit controller or the Avid or whatever in the basement in the machine room, and but they still want the, the monitors up in the edit suite or, or or wherever to look, you know, really good, really very sharp, as if as if the monitor was connected over a little short cable, um. And, and so uh, having a familiarity with those standards, both from an electrical point of view and, and the protocols that run over them, it, you know, serves you well. I mean, there are well-established ways of extending VGA, of extending uh, DVI and all those kind of things, but um, it's, it's probably worth going over them. So, so there I've got up on screen at the moment, um, I suppose what, what, what we'd regard as being the most common um, uh, display adapters, display sort of standards. There's VGA, yeah. which is the high-density 15-pin um, connector. I'll just grab one here from this little pile of stuff I've got to the side of me <laughs> you know we're all we're all very familiar um, with yeah. that the high density 15 pin connector 15 pins in something the same size as a D9 um, and you know don't ever ask a wireman to solder that because they're the, they're the very I, I was just saying I, to <laughs> myself thank god I've never had to wire one <laughs> yeah, they're, they're the very devil so the, the, the thing to do is to, to make sure you've got the right pre-made cables in fact you, you know they come in all flavors so this this one breaks out to BNC's um, uh, you know with the with the color components on it um, and uh, in fact, if we uh, if I pop over to uh, there's, there's quite a nice Wikipedia article about the whole business, um, yeah. and 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 that shows us what's on those various pins. So just let me uh, just let me 
make that a bit bigger. And there are what you'd expect, the red, green, and blue video. Um, there's also a variety of different kind of sync standards. So, so if I look at the, the labeling on these, these BNCs that connect to this 15 pin VGA connector, um, yeah. I've, got, I've got red, green, and blue video, as you'd expect, but I've also got H and V, so horizontal and vertical syncs, because some computer monitors like to have separate horizontal and vertical syncs, and some uh, like to have combined syncs. Uh, and in fact, <coughs> some systems have the syncs on green. So, you know, depending on what kind of graphics card you're using, what kind of monitor you're using, you might find that um, it won't lock just because you've got the wrong model of syncs, the wrong flavor of syncs. Uh -huh. and, and there are little gadgets you can get to go in line to do that, to swap the syncs off, to strip the syncs off the green, to put them, you know, make them composite syncs or, or to take composite syncs and put them on the green or whatever. In fact, just to demonstrate that, I've got a little um, uh, VGA DA here. So, you know, inputs on a, <coughs> sorry, inputs on a, um, a, a D15 connector, and then you can either output on, on BNCs. But I don't know if you can, how well you can see that. There you've got, of course it's mirror image, there you've got the, um, a bunch of um, dip switches that allow you to lift syncs and, and reassign them. So you can, you, you can have syncs on green or, or composite syncs or horizontal and vertical syncs and it'll sort it out for you. So that's, that's something. So, so typically where would you come across <coughs> these variations? I, you know. Well, so, so um, uh, the reason I've, I've got one of those kicking around, and that's, that's, that's an old one just been sitting in the workshop for 10 years probably, is that when before DVI and, and when we were extending Avid displays um, over over VGA, I always found the nicest results came by doing it over quality video coax rather than trying to use right. sort of like you know combined VGA type cable to run up to the edit suite. And of course, Wireman and engineers are very familiar with video coax, so to have an extra three coax cables to carry the two monitor feeds wasn't wasn't onerous and you know hey if that room was used for something else those cables would be good for something else so i used to use these uh, procon um sort of vga da processors quite a lot i mean it's not an expensive gadget yeah. it's a, sort of 200 pounds or whatever <coughs> and so consequently um uh, I'd use that that facility to put syncs on green quite a lot cuz most graphics cards do right. do horizontal and vertical syncs most monitors are happy with all three standards. And so I used to use eArmor 20 inch um, yeah. big glass tube monitors that, you know, I mean, if any engineer who kind of worked in the 90s and the early noughties <laughs> will have broken their backs moving big Mitsubishi monitors around, you know, for yes, Avid. Yeah. Um, but the, the nice thing about the eArmors was that they had BNCs on the back. So, so it was just, it was a nice edit suite monitor to be able to connect up to the wall box, you know, because it had BNCs. So, so at Resolution, at Big Brother, and all, all those shows where there were large numbers of edit suites a long way away from a truck or a long way away from a machine room, I used to live and die on these things. So that's, that, that was really why I used to use those a lot. Now, right. the, the other thing you might notice about this sort of list of, of, of um, the pins is you've got some monitor ID bits. So pin 4, ID bit 2, and uh, pin 11 is ID bit 0, pin 12 is ID bit 1. Yeah. Uh, and, and th there was this idea with VGA that um, there was a modest amount of signaling that could go back to the graphics card from the um, from the monitor to tell it what kind of monitor it was. You know, and it would say, you know, but with only four pins, you've really only got 16 variations of monitor. And so typically one pin would say whether it was capable of only 50 hertz video or whether it could do higher video. And then other pins w could give an indication of how, how high res the monitor was. And in fact, yeah. Apple used to spoil it because Apple monitors used to use a different set of standards. And so if you were using a regular <laughs> PC monitor on an Apple computer, um, you'd have to get there. They used to make these little adapters. I used to have one in my toolbox and it just had a bunch of pins on it. And, and it would be crazy resolutions like 892 by 416 pixels, you know, and things like that, which you never heard yeah. of in PC world. But, but, but yeah. in the Apple world, it was, you know, sort of they, were the, they, they were the resolutions. But obviously that, that, that system could only go so far because, you know, th four pins that can be held high or low, that only gives you 16 variations. And so quite quickly, um, they introduced this idea of uh, using the ID pins not to signal back just four binary digits, but they, they equipped it with the Philips I squared C bus, which is a well-established sort of low data rate control bus. Um, 
uh, that's used it everywhere, you know, in dishwashers and cars. And, you know, it's a well-established, there's lots of chips that, 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 that do that. And, okay. and, and then the monitor could send a whole lot of other information back. It can actually send all the resolutions it was capable of. And, 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 and the graphics card could query it. What kind of monitor are you? You know, what, what, what color depths can you support? You know, what's your gamut? And everything could kind of come back. And that was called um, a DDC, uh, Display Data Channel. Um, and and, okay. uh, and and so that, that 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 was very common, and that's how you can plug your analog um, uh, monitor into your analog graphics card. And Microsoft Windows can say, "Ha ha, it's a Dell two two three zero model ah. monitor." And so, I, which pins is that data coming back on? Is that just on those same four? Or, or uh, it just goes back on two of them. Two. two of them actually. And uh, I've yeah. I've got the Wikipedia page up at the moment. It's pin twelve, which is uh, uh, oh yeah, w- yeah, I see. Uh, and, then, and then and then pin fifteen, and it's just a twi- single twisted pair, um, which is the I squared C bus. Um, so that's very convenient. That's very handy, and 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 uh, and, and in fact, um, things like this Procon um, VJ um, uh, adapter um, DA uh, box, you know, that can either spoof monitor idents or it can ho- hold them high or low. Uh, you know, and that's very very handy. You know, if, if if you're extending the feed over a bunch of BNCs, no data is getting back over that over that I squared C bus, and so it's it's nice that the box can kind of take the place of that and that can signal back to the workstation i know you can't so see if you, if you don't have that signal coming back what happens then uh, well in the case of microsoft windows windows identifies the monitor as a generic vga device and 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 you have to work hard to make it go past 640 by 480 you know lego vision vga um uh, and, yeah. uh, and 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 so you really do need some way. And in fact, in fact, there's been occasions when I've had to just make up little 15 pin to 15 pin adapters where I've spoofed those those pins, tied them high and low, just to make Windows see something different from what it's actually uh, really got on the end of the cable. Yeah. <coughs> so that concept of of the monitor being able to signal back to the um, uh, uh, to, to, the monitor being able to signal back to the graphics card or the machine that was driving it, what kind of device it was, um, obviously very useful, and and, and that and that uh, has become quite a, a fully featured um, aspect of of DVI. Now DVI is the is the digital display standard, which uh, you know. So I'm holding up a little adapter there. You can see that, and in fact, this little yeah. breakout adapter here. That that's well, that's a better picture, isn't it? Yeah, you've got DVI there. And let's go back yeah. to my my PDF um, uh, where I've got a much better picture actually. I'm showing the the, the two. Um, Variations of DVI, single link and dual link, um, yeah. and a single link can can carry up to 1920 by 1200 um, resolution signal, and that's 155 megabytes per second if memory serves. Uh, and then dual link is um, full 29 pin connector, so that's got another set of pins again, and that can carry up to 310 megabytes per second, and that's capable of going all the way up to. Uh, 3840 by 2400 so almost 4k type resolution yeah so you know very high res and it does that over four twisted um four twisted pair connections that are referred to as tmds data lanes um so tmds transition minimized uh digital signal which means that there's there's either manchester coding or NRZI encoding applied to them so that there's never a big DC component on the signal and it's scrambled so as to give it real kind of lots of clocking edges for the receiving equipment to work on Um, and but but each one of the data lanes carries red green blue or the control channel and they're dedicated to that and that's how they do it now the other thing that's that's worth pointing out about about DVI is is I'm just hovering my mouse um, on, on on DVI I connectors um, yeah. You've got the, so so the, the um, so if I hold hold that up to the camera, you can see on 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 that side there where I'm pointing, you've got that little kind of like thick sort of spade type locator yeah. key, and that's carrying um, that's carrying chassis ground. No, it's carrying signal ground. Um, but on a, on a combined I connector, and that, was, that wasn't that was a D connector which doesn't have the extra pins. Um, on a on an I connector, um, which you can see on the screen, where I'm also holding up. Um, the, <laughs> this one here, you can see yeah. it has um, four little um, pins that surround the little spade, and in yeah. fact they carry analog, RGB, and sinks. And so, Ooh, right, okay. In the case of a graphics card, which may have to feed <clears throat> an analog monitor, or it may have to feed a DVI monitor, um, they will put they'll, they'll expose both signal types on the connector. DVI I oh. carries both RGB and digital 
DVI signal. Um, however, you know, you also see DVI-D connectors where they don't have that facility. So, you know, that's... Uh, I was just looking to see if I had an adapter to hand. No, I haven't. I was... Well, so that's how the, you're the thinking, uh, you're thinking about one of these aren't you? RGB connect adapters work, right? Okay. Yeah. So the, oh yes, that's you, you often get these with workstations, where yeah, that's right. You can see. So it's using that's using the those four that's pins using, no, those, surrounding those, those four pins there, and it's breaking them out onto the onto the D-type connector there. And obviously that's that's just a little passive adapter. That's like a three-pound gadget. There's no electronics in there. So there's there's no digital yeah. to analog conversion in there, um, but that's just doing the job of breaking out. To the to, to the connector that will go to your monitor if you've only got an analog monitor. And that's, yeah. Uh, yeah, that's very convenient. Um, so DVI, you know, s served us well for many years um, from the early noughties until well until now. Really, you still still see DVI monitors mm -hmm. and graphics cards with DVI outputs. But the the kind of the new kid on the block, I suppose, which came really in the mid noughties, I suppose, really with Blu-ray, um, is HDMI. And so I'm just sort of holding up a, an HDMI connector there to see. Yeah. Um, an HDMI. Got mine here. Yeah, look at that. I hope, uh, <laughs> I hope I hope you bought that at a reasonably priced Emporium and not one of those places that charges you fifty quid for an HDMI cable. No, no, no. I, th I think this is from Tesco's. Yes, HDMI has reached Dursley and uh, Tesco's. <laughs> so I think um, you know, obviously, as as, as domestic high resolution standards became popular, you know, manufacturers knew they'd need a very simple cable that could carry everything between the back of a Blu-ray player or, you know, the, the HD DVD standard that, that didn't take off, which I still have an HD DVD player. <laughs> um, uh, that they, they knew that they'd need th that to run between and, and, and set-top boxes and PVRs and all the, all the sort of domestic equipment and the back of a, a domestic high resolution uh, television set. And, and that's really where HDMI was born. And HDMI has gone through, you know, five or six variations now. Yeah. And, and the current standard... Um, which is 1.4 has lots of facilities there you know there's there's a, there's a, an ethernet return channel so that your so that your smart television can communicate stuff back to the blu-ray player so that your blu-ray player can um receive the down mixed stereo uh um feed back from the or, or rather your, your domestic amplifier can receive the down mixed stereo feed back from the telly there's, there's a whole bunch of stuff in there um all very clever you know, can carry 3D um, pictures, you know, both interleaved and side by side and all those kind of things. Um, you know, deep color, 32-bit color space, um, you know, sync information so that, you know, if your telly's got quite a lot of delay through it, you can you can force auto resync in your, in your um, hi-fi receiver. So there's a lot of clever stuff in HDMI. Yeah. But actually, essentially, it is electrically identical to DVI. And, and this is borne out by the fact that, look, you can have that. You can have a, a, a passive cable, which has got an HDMI connector on one end and a DVI connector on the other end. Um, you know, and, and if yep. you have a, uh, a device that has DVI output and you hang a computer monitor off it, you know, so long as the resolutions will match and such, it'll work. Um, and and uh, you know, similarly, you can use your DVI output from your laptop to drive an HDMI input on your television. Uh, you know, so they are identical electrical standards, but HDMI can carry an awful lot more than DVI was right. ever ever sort of designed or envisaged to carry. Um, uh, and, and part of that is EDID, the Extended Display Interface. Uh, interface, oh, I can't remember what the D stands for. And also there's HDCP, <laughs> the High Definition Content Protection System. And these are both oh, yes. these are both metadata types that can c travel across the HDMI connector. So. Yeah. Um, just really, I suppose to finish that off, DisplayPort is is the current thing. Well, it was the current thing a year ago. Um, Thunderbolt's the current thing now. But DisplayPort, which comes in a couple of different sizes, there's, there's Mini DisplayPort, which you see on the back of, you know, Apple graphics cards and the side of modern laptops. And uh, then there's full-size DisplayPort, which will eventually uh, replace HDMI because um, HDMI is a licensed technology and. Uh, People oh, who build, right. you know, people who build budget Blu-ray players that you buy, you know, f you know, for fifty quid at the end of the aisle in Tesco, resent the fact they have to spend ten dollars with, with um, the Hollywood Alliance to license um, uh, HDMI. So DisplayPort oh. essentially re will replace HDMI because it's a license-free connector, and um, it can do a whole lot more than HDMI. It can it can kind of back rev itself to behave like HDMI, but it's it's a lot more fully featured standard. Um, it still has the same TM. It, is it? It's a different connector or the same connector at the it looks, end? It looks I mean, very, very similar. It's a different connector. They, they, they're not compatible. But it won't, it won't go in the hole. 
No, not at all. And you can get passive adapters to, to break out to, to DVI or to HDMI. And in fact, that's what this is. And this is what I carry around in my laptop. It's, uh, you know, for, for use with projectors and such. It's a, uh, it's a um, mini display port out of the laptop, uh, which breaks out to a, a DVI connector. And again, that's, yeah. Yeah, that's a five pound piece. There's no, there's no active electronics in there at all. Now, the clever thing about DisplayPort is that it has the same uh, TMDS data lanes as DVI and HDMI, but they're not assigned particularly. So, so it's up to when you connect a, a DisplayPort display to a DisplayPort graphics card or DisplayPort Blu-ray player, there's a phase where uh, called link training, where where the, where the device has to negotiate with the um, uh, with the display as to as to how it's going to utilise the, the the TMDS data lanes. And the default behaviour is, if it can, to stick the RGB and control data down one lane. Uh, which kind of sh and I think I think the lanes can run at 380 megabytes per second, so very very fast. Oh, okay. Um, okay. And, uh, and 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 so the, it it would mean that um, uh, the system. Sorry, sorry, it's actually half that. It's 17.28 um, oh, okay. uh, uh, gigabytes per second. Sorry, megabytes per second. Gigabits per second yes. would be a tenth of that. Um, uh, so, so it allows, or, or it, 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 it anticipates the future where we will have higher resolution. I mean, at some point we'll have 4K displays in the home. You know, why? But we will. Um, color depth um, and all those other things, um, uh, you know, will eventually come. In. And so the, the, the thing is that the, disp the display port really is a very extensible standard and will cover all those things yeah. eventually. Um, but yeah, although it can, display port can, but if it sees an HDMI monitor at the end of its cable, it will say, oh, it's an HDMI monitor. I have to use the uh, TMDS data lanes this way. I have to use data lane one for the red, and, and I can only run it at this data rate and all this kind of stuff. And so it can, it can back rev and emulate uh, DVI and HDMI. It's not limited by those standards. It's, it's a much more okay. fully featured standard. So it's a phenomenal piece of planning, actually. You know, you have hats off to the, to the, the committees that do it. Yeah, I mean, it's mostly Intel actually. Intel have been behind most of Is these. Is it really? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Hats off to them. Yeah. Um, uh, so, so uh, we spoke about um, uh, DDC that travels over the I squared C bus for um, yeah. good old fashioned, um, you know, SVGA on on pins eleven and fifteen. Uh, uh, the, the the equivalent thing, which is just entirely metadata, which comes back up the um, the, the C. TMDS data lane of DVI yep. and HDMI is is called uh, uh, um, EDID extended display identification data oh, and, okay. and 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 that can carry an awful lot more stuff than um, uh, you know DCC ever could um, it's much more much more defined uh, and, and you know the, the format um, is uh, you know, a, a, a allows for big um, sort of 128 bytes of information to describe the monitor and all those bytes are defined as to what they mean and I'm just sort of scrolling through the very long wik Wikipedia article about it um, my word you can find out everything you wanted to oh yes um, but because EDID isn't isn't a point to point um, you know I'm I, 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 you know I've got I've got a, a twisted pair data connection that allows me to move some data you know albeit at a, a low data rate but 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 well defined because it's it's packetized up and goes down with the display information there's always the question of, of, does it arrive a frame late? If I'm extending it over a fiber optic extender, you know, which is something like this, yeah. where I've got you know, uh, SC connectors there and, and, and HDMI out there, and, and I'm sending it you know, a few hundred meters to the edit suite, um, some things get a bit fussy about, about EDID data arriving late or, or not being there the moment they query for it. And so, EDID management has become something of an issue, really, for, for, for us people who, who build edit suites and build facilities where you want to move the flame from that room to that room, and that room was a Final Cut Pro yesterday, and it's swapped over with the flame today, and, and you know, that's a Linux workstation, that's a Windows workstation, that's a Mac workstation. Um, EDID management, yeah. even if you have you know, similar models of monitor throughout your facility, becomes a consideration. Um, there was one facility um, in Old Street that we built a few years ago, probably three years ago, where um, uh, we had lots of trouble with um, uh, EDID. Um, you, you know, we, we had a little matrix, and then eventually we, we, we resorted to just doing it on patch panels using ruggedized fiber patch cords. 
and we couldn't get this thing to work reliably. The, the, the operators would come in in the morning, and they'd, they'd assign all the graphics workstations to the various machines that were going to use them, and they'd find that half of them, either the displays wouldn't come up, or they'd only come up in very low resolution. And, and it, you know, it was all entirely down to bad EDID management, because the display extenders we were using weren't passing the EDID data in a timely fashion. And so OS X in particular, the version of X386, which is the display technology underlying most Unix-like operating systems, um, it either does silly things like it caches EDID data for the second monitor, why, nobody knows, or if, yeah. it, if it doesn't see a response, the frame that it issues, the EDID request, it will assume that there's just a very low resolution monitor that can't respond at the end of the link. And so, um, you can, and there's a lot you can find out. So, so the, here's I've just got up on screen now the, the EDID profile response from an Envision yep. um, uh, 775 monitor, um, which if you at the command line, if you if you type that command start x uh, double dash uh, long verbose six, it, that that's what gets passed back to you, um, and and there's everything you need to know there really. Um, you know how big the monitor is, what what data, ra what what frame rates it's capable of, its its native resolution, and all those kind of things. Um, and, and that should hopefully allow the um, graphics card to make some sensible decisions about, about what it's going to do with that monitor, how it's going to drive it. Um, but um, with, with this one facility, uh, we found that to reliably get a workstation to come up with a different pair of monitors that it hadn't seen the day before, we'd often have to go through nine reboots. And I've got the list up there, uh, um, uh, you know that 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 you know was on the on the laminated card on the operator's desk kind of thing, and it really is you know having to increment the, the device resolution, reboot, check the resolution stuck, uh -huh. you, you know swap the monitor to the display port output, reboot, you know you know and a real a real nightmare, um, and it took us a long time to figure out that what we needed was and several people do them, um, is these EDID managers. And they're just little boxes, and I've got a, I've got the two that we routinely use. One made by Lightware, and one just a no-name one that Lindy import from Taiwan. Um, and they're just little boxes. They're rather good. The Lightware ones are a bit more fully featured than the Lindy, uh, but they will just sit on the back of the computer pre the the um, the, the HDMI or the DVI over fiber extenders. And as soon as they see an EDID inquiry from the graphics card they'll just return what you want them to return. So you can say, whatever the graphics, whenever the graphics card says, please give me your EDID profile, just return this profile. Don't even bother passing it up the stream to the monitor to see what the monitor says. Just pass them this profile. And, and that solves everything. That, that means that you can, you can just have a bunch of computers that as far as they're concerned, every time they wake up, they're seeing a pair of Dell 24 inch monitors, 1920 by 1200, everybody's happy. But some of the suites have got you know, HP model monitors. Some of them have got Sony model monitors, and it. But so long as they're all of similar resolution, it doesn't matter. Um, and and, and the, the 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 Lightware one um, basically comes with fifty pre-rolled EDID profiles that kind of cover most eventualities. And then it has fifty memory locations where it can capture from an existing monitor. And, and it, so if you've got a monitor that you just have to emulate you can capture its EDID profile into the box and using those little sort of turn switches you can say every time it's inquired of you pass back monitor X's configuration please the Lindy one is not quite as fully featured it has I think it has about two or three profiles that it will pass back itself but it can capture a profile as well which really is the killer feature that's what you want you want to be able to capture yeah. a profile store it in the flash memory in the unit and then every time a graphics card says you know what are you it says don't even worry about the graphics monitor that's up in the edit suite. I'm just going to tell you what what you want to hear, kind of thing. Yeah. And that has th these little gadgets, and 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 the lightware one's quite expensive. It's a couple of hundred quid. So I tend to keep that as as a as a um as a, in my toolbox. Uh, but the Lindy ones are sort of forty something quid each. And so uh, essentially, I specify every, you know one per monitor in facilities that we yeah. build now. Yeah. It seems like a small extra price to pay for that that level of reliability and yeah. and not worrying. And the other thing, um. So Autodesk, who make Flame, which is a very popular, um, uh, you know, film effects system, mm -hmm. when that's running on a on a on a, um, a Linux machine, because there are two versions. There's the sort of the light version that runs on Mac, and then there's the expensive, you know, 180,000 pound version that runs on a Linux workstation on a Hewlett Packard Z800. Um, uh, that they've they've written their own version of X, you know, the Unix display uh, system, uh, and it actually uses the fact that it can query the provided monitor um, very quickly 
And if they discover that you're using a different model of monitor than the Sony that they sell you with the workstation, they won't even let um, uh, they won't let Linux run up to to, to a graphics interface. It, it stalls a, a text interface. And uh, oh, you know the one facility we were building last year, I spent days scratching my head as to why with the monitor in the machine room I could get the workstation to run up to its graphics interface and hence launch the Flame software. But as soon as I moved the monitor into the edit suite, it would happily run up the text interface. But as soon as I tried to launch, launch X to log in as a graphical user, it, it refused to. And it just took me a long, long time to figure it out. And, and it was, you know, it was just entirely down to that. But they intentionally um. stop you from doing that because they will sell you a thousand pound extender of their own, which is just the job, you know. Um, but that you know, is really horrible. One, yes. one, one of these little lindy, lindy boxes. Yeah, it is, yeah. One of these little lindy boxes. Put put pay to all that nonsense. I just I just took the box into the edit suite, <laughs> connected it to the back of the of the of the very smart Sony monitor they sell with the workstation. Captured the Sony's EDID profile, took the lindy box back into the into the machine room, hung it off the back of the computer. You know, spliced it in the path to the to the um, the fiber DVI extender, and hey presto, everything was good. Um, so uh, just just something to be uh, aware of, really. Um, well, that's worth the price of entry, if nothing else. Is good <laughs> gracious. Yeah. So I um, wanted to talk a little bit more about. Um, so we've talked about EDID, which which yeah. is um, uh, uh, the metadata that, that allows the monitor to signal back to the graphics card or the Blu-ray player or whatever um, what kind of um, display device it is, and hopefully make some intelligent. Um, decisions about how it can be best be driven. The other commonly passed metadata over DVI and, and HDMI <coughs> is HDCP, the, the High Definition Content Protection System, which um, the Hollywood Alliance, I think, essentially insisted had to be included with Blu-ray and and all yeah. subsequent domestic high definition systems. And that's because they were aware that the 40-bit um, encryption system that came with um, DVDs in the sort of mid late 90s um, uh, content scrambling system CSS was very quickly cracked and it's trivial now to to, to, to decrypt DVDs you know <coughs> everybody's got a bit of their, their favorite bit of ripping software that allows them to yeah. rip the, the, the loosely <coughs> encrypted MP2 data off a DVD uh, onto their computer and then turn it into something that their their iPod will play or whatever, um, and and that was trivial and it was so trivial that, that that everybody thinks that they should be able to do it. You know why why shouldn't you? I own that content kind of thing, and so the Hollywood Alliance, um, the MPAA, decided they had to have a system that was strong enough to resist all of that, and and in fact they came up with this idea that relies on um, public key cryptography. Now, oh yes. We could, we could talk a little bit about public key cryptography. I mean, I suppose the salient point about public key crypto is it's asymmetric cryptography. So you think about symmetric cryptography, um, you use the same key to encrypt as you do to decrypt some data. Um, yeah. And typically that will be a 64-128-bit, you know, at most 256-bit key that yeah. essentially is XORed with the plain text uh, to produce the cipher text. Yeah. And and that's very easily done. It's easy, easy done in hardware. You know, they're just gates to XOR mm -hmm. the data, and so, and so that kind of encryption can happen very quickly. The other kind of encryption, public key crypto, or sometimes called asymmetric uh, key cryptography, is where you have a very large number, and uh, which is which forms one part of a key. So, so public key crypto, one key is the encrypting key, and one key is the decrypting key. And one key can be kept publicly, i.e., in your web browser or, you know, on the um, in the header of the Blu-ray disc, so that anybody with with enough nows can discover what that key is. But the other key, so that's the encrypting key. The decrypting key um, is is stored in your Blu-ray player, or it's stored, you know, at the server that's serving up your web page. And so, um, not only can you only decrypt the content. With the decrypting key, which is different from the encrypting key, um, it also means that, that the encrypting key and the decrypting key never have to be held in the same place. Right. Now that means you have to have very large keys. You know, typically 4096 bits is is, is common for public key crypto, oh, really? and the algorithms are computationally hard. So so actually nothing ever gets, not much ever gets done over public key crypto. Public key crypto is normally used just to exchange a a generated on the fly symmetric key, um, right. uh, and, and then and then because that's because that key has been exchanged under the cover of a very secure 
asymmetric system, you know that you can then trust that symmetric key because right. nobody ever got to see it because it was never exchanged in plain sight, as it were. Yeah, yeah. Um, and this is exactly how, how the encryption on Blu-ray works. So the idea is that um, you have on the Blu-ray disc something called a volume key. Uh, okay. And the volume key, um, that's the encrypting key. And that allows you to generate a symmetric cipher key, which again can be done in hardware, um, which, but you can only get to that if you have the decrypting key. And the decrypting key, the other half of the public-private key crypto pair, is stored in the, in the playback device or, or actually in the monitor or anywhere that has to be able to make the data visible. Um, and that's called the device key. Okay. Um, now, the idea is that if the Hollywood Alliance were to ever discover that somebody had produced a gadget that allowed easy copying of high-definition content, they would just revoke their public key, their of volume course. key. And then any yes. subsequent Blu-ray discs that came out wouldn't have their volume key on, and so their DVD player, their, their Blu-ray player, wouldn't be able to play it back. And that would be a disaster. If you bought Mr. Sony's latest and greatest Blu-ray player, and a year later the Hollywood Alliance said, ha-ha, Mr. Sony, you've played fast and loose with the standard. You're letting people make digital copies of our high-definition content. We're going to revoke your key. All of a sudden... You know, all the new uh, uh, titles that come out on Blu-ray won't play in your Sony player. And so that's the encouragement to the manufacturers never <coughs> to allow your keys to become compromised and hence your device to be used to play back encrypted content so that it can be copied. And that's why, for example, um, uh, we quite often get people complaining to us about... Um, uh, the, these things, these these um, HDMI to HDSDI converters, which are very convenient if you want to be able to play mm. back HDMI over an HDSDI um, infrastructure. But if you've got some HDCP encrypted material, there's no way a gadget like this can convert that to an unencrypted um, output because you know next week the Hollywood Alliance would say, flipping it, Mr. Blackmagic, you know, we, we, gave you, we gave you a device key, but you're letting people make unencrypted um, uh, HDSDI full resolution copies of our material. We're going to we're going to revoke your blinking keys. And so, <coughs> it's there's no way manufacturers can make boxes that can turn HDMI <laughs> into HDSDI and support HDCP. I often get engineers phoning us and saying that that AJA converter you sold it's not HDCP compliant. And my answer is, well, how on earth could it be HDCP compliant? The whole point of HDCP is that you can't yeah. do what you want to do. It's fine for unencrypted material. It's fine for you know, review and approval copy that somebody made in the machine room on a Blu-ray disc. But you're not going to be able to play a sell-through movie that's got HDCP applied to it you know, and turn it into unencrypted HDSDI. That's just not allowed. Yeah. Um, so there's this whole idea of key exchange uh, and, and key exchange between... Um, the public key uh, and, and, and the private key and and being able to, uh, and the Hollywood Alliance being assured that whenever something's traveling over the wire where it could be intercepted, it's it's encrypted and using strong mm -hmm. encryption that, that is very hard to break. And when I say very hard to break, the kind of thing that would need millions of contemporary computers for millions of years, you know, they're, 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 they're those kind of levels of, you know, encryption, um, yeah, much stronger than anything the military uses kind of thing. Right. Um, so that's, that's the device key and the volume key. And remember, it's, it's a very large number. I mean, a remarkably large number, 4,000-bit number. And to factorize a 4,000-bit number takes, you know, an awful lot of computing power, you, you know, lifetime of the universe type computing power, uh, uh, to try and find the um, other half of, of the key pair if you don't know what the private key is. Yeah. And, and so one's the encrypting key, one's the decrypting key. If, but you know, bear those things in mind and you'll, you'll have a good feel for how um, uh, public-private pri private key crypto works. asymmetric yes. cryptography works. Um, so um, the stream cipher that passes from the back of the Blu-ray player um, to, the, uh, to the monitor on the wall um, is passing encrypted, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and there's no way on earth that you can record that because it's, it's meaningless. And when it gets to your television, there's the HDCP circuitry in your television is able to, because it has a valid um, device key, it's able to decrypt that material. Um, 
and 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 so really that's 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 the whole business of HDCP and uh, I've got another quite a good slide or I thought I had quite a good slide here about how that works over distribution amplifiers yes here we go so oh, yes 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 <coughs> it's not unusual for a for, for in a shop for example for you to want to be able to play the same blu-ray disc on four screens and you think well hang on a second there has to be a little key exchange between the between each of those monitors and the and the blu-ray player before that works and uh and and then that's the, the HDMI or HD HDMI or DVI-DAs have to support that. They have to support this idea of of syncs and repeaters and sources. The source being the Blu-ray player, the sync being the display device, and the repeater being the distribution amplifier. And and the repeater has to the, the, the distribution amplifier has to be able to arbitrate that whole business of key exchange. And so I don't know if you've ever noticed if you when you power up your Blu-ray player. Um, uh, it can take a little while for it to negotiate with the display before you start getting pictures. Um, if you've got four pic four monitors, it takes four times as long because it has to do four times as much um, um, arbitration, and that's all yeah. handled by the by the distribution amplifier. Uh, and it only takes one of those to fail for the arbitration between the um, the distribution amplifier and the Blu-ray player to fail. So if you can imagine, you had a, a like a retail location with with thirty screens around the store. If one of those had compromised keys, where Mr. Sonny had decided that you can't display on that monitor, all of a sudden your whole shop doesn't work. So it's a further, Ooh. it's a further sort of like a push to the manufacturers to not play fast and loose with, um, uh, with their keys. All of which makes it extremely expensive game to start in. So uh, yes, if you're if you've suddenly invented a new monitor, you're going to have a really tough time. Um, yeah, I getting think, one of these keys, I would think. Well, I think actually it's a key per HDMI input. So if you buy your, your modern television, which has got three HDMI in, inputs or however many, um, each one of those separate inputs has has its own device key. And and you could imagine that this, you know, display, data could work on one port but not the other one because because one of them has been compromised and turned off You know, back, oh. at, back at Hollywood Central where they arbitrate all this stuff. So um, there, there, are, there are people... With very long beards and a huge ledger, probably with a quill pen, <laughs> noting each number. <laughs> well, there, there, there has been just one actual case of the MPAA um, disabling a device key, and that was for a software player. And I think it was Cyberlink version 10, which is a you know a, 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 um, a player that you run on your PC to watch Blu-ray players yeah. on your laptop or whatever. And what happened with them was, um, uh, you know, clever hackers discovered that if you ran a um, if in your if you're in your development environment you 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 paused the process running in that window so you in essentially you you externally paused um, the processor cycles being allocated to that task yeah. and then you looked through the memory that, that that process has been allocated of course at some point in the memory the key the private key is exposed, was, yeah. is exposed. and 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 that's how about three years ago you suddenly started seeing websites popping up publishing the keys for all these different movies it was because they just had a copy of Cyberlink 10 they play the Blu-ray they pause it externally using whatever the, the, their development tool was Microsoft Visual Studio or whatever and then they just step up through the memory decrypting the first frame of video until they saw a, 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 a nice clear picture all of a sudden you've discovered the key because at somewhere in the memory space the megabyte of memory that that application's using the key must be un available in an unencrypted fashion. So the Hollywood Alliance um, revoked Cyberlink's device key. And so all of a sudden, no new uh, Blu-rays would play on Cyberlink. So it, ah. it has happened and it does work. Um, yeah. So it's kind of just interesting, really. Yeah. Wow. Well, that's been a very interesting long journey. Um, we've gone from the 1980s and uh, digital television is a certain grey-haired gentleman would understand. Uh, and these, uh, these, these monkeys who've come in with, with their computers, how they've combined and how we now shift the picture between the two. Until finally, you can't show the picture at all without Mr Hollywood's permission. <laughs> so, well, I suppose it, it's it, been, it had to happen, really, didn't it? <laughs> uh, yes, it probably did, actually. But, but that doesn't affect our production environment. It's just something to be aware of, that if you're testing it by thinking, oh, I'll just, you know, here I am, I'll put me Hollywood favorite video on it may not work whereas the uh, dvd or the blu-ray blu you've just burnt from your in your production environment will work so um yes very interesting uh, very worth knowing that's a, it's so a, that's fantastic it's exactly right i i, I thought i'd um because because you know we've obviously done a few of these this so far this year 
I thought mm. I'd just remember folks where they could uh, where they could find this stuff. Um, yes, please. <clears throat> Blip TV are the nice people who who um, um, host all this stuff for us, um, and I've just got uh, the page up with our various previous podcasts on, um, and you can also find us on YouTube. Um, and again, I'll, I'll put up lower thirds uh, with the, the simple URLs for this, and uh, iTunes as well. In fact, if I uh, if I just uh, on your on your on your favourite device, you can uh, don't look at that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah. that's a previous uh, previous one. <laughs> Um, and, uh, and and there's obviously you, Hugh, um, who's uh, I've got your site up at the moment. Um, so, uh, do you, I mean, do, do you want to just 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 mention the kind of things you're up to at the moment? I mean, we were talking before we started recording about what you've been up to recently. I know that's a tiny bit sensitive, but uh, but I find it interesting. Okay, okay, yes. Uh, well, the, the project I'm working on at the moment is um, for an organisation called Skillset. Um, you may may be aware of Skillset, but if you're not, Skillset is one of the skills sector councils. Um, all our industry apparently in this country has skills sector councils that look after them. Skill set looks after the creative industries. And in the little bit of what they're doing that we're interested in is they're, they're looking after um, the film and television industries. They also look after print and makeup and hair, a whole range of things. But in the, in the context of film and television, um, about five years ago, they started looking at the huge plethora of media courses that are, are available and saying, if you are um, somebody looking to take a course at a university, uh, how do you work out which media course is better suited? And the real thing is this. Academia does one thing and it does it really well. It, you know, it has a whole job to do. Industry does another thing and it does it very well. But there is a point where industry and uh, academia meet that little sort of little over that sort of overlap where uh, industry says look we need people with these skills at this time and academia and amongst the various things it does is capable and indeed does produce people with some of those skills at the right time uh, and the whole purpose of the skill sector council is to make sure that the UK PLC has the right people at the right time with the right skills and that's that's its basic remit so um, I was um, honoured enough to be involved in the in the first pass five years ago which was looking at um, uh, universities we went round I can't remember the numbers now but I think about 30 or 40 were visited I think I did 25 uh, looking at the, at the courses mine and not not at that time not at course level at looking at, at, at uh, institution level and I think something like 15 or 20 I forget the actual numbers got the green tick the the skill set tick and that meant industry um, production, post-production, um, and various other bits. So there was a, a team of half a dozen or so that went around each institution, had looked at the, at the institution, looked at the facilities, looked at the, uh, met the, the, the tutors and the senior management, and said, yes, we think that they've got a good offering. So we'd be happy for people to come from there. Um, doesn't mean to say that courses that, or, or, or colleges that don't have that tick aren't any good at all. It's just that we weren't convinced when we saw them that they were doing what would, would immediately work for, for our industry. Um, and of course, you know, as testament to the fact that you don't have to go to a specific course to get a, a, a job in it. I, you know, many, many people, very few people really who work in, in our industries had actually had those kind of um, courses. However, if you are um, fortunate enough to have gone to one of those colleges, it's fantastic. Now, this is the second uh, iteration. This is a pilot scheme. Um, they are now taking this down a lot more granular. This is down to course level and looking at, uh, I, I can't remember the number, something like just under 200 courses across the country. I'm only involved in those which, which have got a, a particular technical angle. And we are now visiting a whole range of them uh, right across the country from Scotland to the south coast, to the east coast, to the west coast, England, Wales. And the teams are uh, are out there right now looking at them, um, and it's absolutely fascinating. Uh, the, the there's uh, there's a lot of really good work going on out there. So um, yeah, keep your eye. If you're looking for a, for a course for yourself or for somebody you know, then um, it's going to be worth. I think that the process is is quite slow. Um, there's an almighty amount of work to do, and as I say, it's a, it's a pilot scheme. So there's a um, we're sort of feeling our way along a, a bit. Um, more to do with the, the actual mechanics i mean you probably can't see in the background here but i have boxes huge boxes of of, of, of paperwork um, you know the man with a van arrives with this hundreds of uh, folders and back at, at skillset hq there's a woman who's who's managing all this lot 
and you can't see her. She's behind a wall of, of huge boxes. So there's a lot to learn about how we do it and how, how online we can do it and how, how much paper-based the exercise has to be. Uh, but I think sometime during the course of next year, uh, you'll start seeing this these ticks and that will be, you know, if, if you can get onto one of those courses, definitely worth the effort of, of, uh, of trying. So it's a really interesting exercise and it gives a an amazing insight to what's going on in this country in terms of uh, producing skilled technicians and skilled operators and it's not just about the you know the, the skill with the with the screwdriver um, an, an awful lot of the courses uh, work really hard to make sure that the you know that the, the uh, technicians understand the why you know there is in many cases as capable of making a program uh, as as the RT types and in fact in many cases I've come across courses where there have been two two parts two actual different uh, departments in, in institutions one where they're taking um, RT people and in, uh, uh, teaching the enough technology to be able to do a good job produce some really high quality work and similarly uh, taking people who are really engineering but insisting that they learn about the art of, uh, and, and craft so that they too can produce extremely high quality work and when you see the work side by side they produce you wouldn't know which was which you, you know maybe that the, the arty people have come up with some more you know off the wall more creative perhaps weird ideas but not necessarily i mean for an awful lot of stuff you know it turns out engineers are pretty weird people anyway so uh, i think we're okay so really interesting thanks for it yes that's fascinating job it's it's very timely for me because my uh, my middle boy Daniel, who, who in fact does the uh, did the music for the start and end of this podcast, he's um, thank you, Daniel. In a year and a half's time, he, he'll be looking to go and, and start um, you know some kind of media engineering degree. So uh, so you know I'll I'll definitely be be plaguing you for more information. Uh, you know, yeah, you're welcome. Over the next year. Yeah, and, and I would say to anybody who's watching this, um, if you're whether you're an engineer or, or not or just not an engineer. Really, Definitely get hit the skill set website. They do a lot of work. They do help subsidize quite a lot of courses. Um, it's very big on education and self development. Um, and also very useful if, if you're somebody who's thinking, right, well, I might, I might fancy a shift in career. Uh, some very helpful places to, to start looking uh, at how you might do that and how you might, as I say, in some cases, they, they, they can offer um, quite good sub subsidies on, on, uh, on, on training courses. So, excellent organization worth supporting fantastic well thank you very much for that Hugh we're, uh, we're done it's been more than an hour and we always said that we kind of try and keep it to less than an hour <laughs> well, yeah, the, the, there was a the, when my next door neighbour arrived to, to uh, tell me that he's ready for me to shift some furniture with him um, that's probably a good natural break at some point. so I do apologise there we are <laughs> okay well thank you chap and uh, we'll do it again soon I look forward to it speak to you soon